We're in part four of our technically six-part series, so we'll also touch on this uh, at Christmas Eve service, uh, Christmas Eve evening. If you're here and in the area, I'd love to have you join us Christmas Eve. For, we'll be doing a candlelight service that night. But we've been talking about trying to figure out you know, how we relate to God, how God relates to us, and, and how that works in very practical, real-life terms. And so in, in part one, we, we first we went back to the Garden of Eden and trying to figure out, okay, what's going on there, and why would, why would God like bring such, such what seems to be harsh judgment for just breaking a rule, don't eat that fruit, ate the fruit, and suddenly mankind's plunged into evil and disobedience. And we looked at that, that's not really what happened, that, that what we're seeing in the Garden of Eden is not that... God gave them a rule and they broke it. It's that uh, what, what the rule was, what the thing was, was let God decide what's good and bad. Let God teach Adam and Eve what good and bad is. And that Adam and Eve decided to do that for themselves. They took the knowledge, the ability to declare good and evil to themselves and decided for themselves what was good and what was not good. And that's what doomed us and that's what dooms us today. And that's even what now destroys our relationships with God and with each other, is this tendency to decide for ourselves what's good and bad. We call it self-determination. I will determine what's right for me, what's good and what's not good for me. And as we do that, it, it just tears us apart. It, it, it sets us against one another. We saw that happen in the Garden of Eden. So then we talked about that once we've done that, once that happens, the, the next thing we do is trying to relate back to God. We tend to relate to God. By rules. We tend now, if God wanted to lead us with wisdom, he'd give us good judgment so that we could make the decisions that honored him and that followed his idea of right and wrong. But instead, since we took the uh, concept of right and wrong for ourselves, that then we start relating God with rules and say, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. Just tell me what's good and bad so that I can kind of make my own decision. And that that's not how it's supposed to work because God wanted to relate to us in a relationship not as a bunch of robots following rules. He wants to teach us his ways. They're better. And so we talked about how do we relate to God by coming back and realizing the Bible is not a rule book. It's a book of wisdom to teach us what God is thinking so that we can be close to him, and that changes us. So that was part two. And then so then last week we talked about that with that concept of rules, we also still want to be good. And because we want to be good, sometimes we try to fake it till we make it sort of thing. Uh, we worry about performing and achieving an outward result. And we saw that God doesn't, isn't interested in that outward result. He's not interested in us putting on a good performance. And so often when we come together as God's people, we do focus on the outward appearance. We focus on looking the right way, and that oftentimes causes us to become hypocritical because we are pretending to be a changed people when we haven't actually changed. And then when that shows up, people say, well, you're hypocrites. We talked about how that we saw Jesus teaching that the change needs to be, be, begin inwardly. And the inward change is not something we accomplish. It's something God accomplishes as we draw close to him. And so we focus on Jesus, and then we will change. And so often we focus on trying to change ourselves. So it's hard. And, and we so easily, even if we know this, we so easily fall back into trying to just follow the rules and act right. And, and that's what we just keep tripping back into. And we're constantly at war, at least I am, constantly at war between what I want to do and what I feel like doing and what feels, it's not just that I feel like doing it, it feels right. It doesn't just feel good, it feels right. And so I'm constantly in this struggle between what feels good and feels right and what God is telling me. And not even just the rules, but wisdom. And I watch that play out all the time with my children because they have ideas of what they really want to do. And sometimes what they really want to do is really stupid. And they shouldn't do it. But when I tell you, you shouldn't do that. But they want to so badly. They feel so strongly. And I'm the same way. And so we're going to look at that struggle today. And, and I had a hard, I'll tell you, I had a hard time putting this message together, just trying to grab, grapple with 
with the teaching here. Let's pray, and then we'll dive into the scripture. <coughs> Excuse me. Good morning, Father. Lord, as we open your word and allow you to speak to us through your word and through your Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray that we will hear you clearly. We know you speak clearly, but for us to understand you well, to hear you well outside of our own agendas and our own limitations, that we would hear your word, understand the wisdom that you're trying to give us, the instruction and the guidance, and the surrender it takes from us to be able to receive and put aside our own thing. So Lord, be with our study this morning, and, and may I speak clearly, may your word speak clearly, may we understand what you're saying, and may we take it in and, and absorb it and digest it and, and hold on to it. So be with our time as we study your word now, and just help us understand you. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be in two passages. The first one is 1 Corinthians 15. <coughs> Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians 15. And the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 is about Jesus rising from the dead, the resurrection. And that was part of why I struggled, because the whole chapter's got some really great stuff, and yet there's just too much for us to cover in one message. So I want to grab a couple of thoughts out of this, and then another time maybe we can come back and do more. But the first, the first section, I just want to grab two verses, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 and 22, because it's part of, as, as Paul is talking a lot about the, the resurrection, he gives a picture that we need today as we understand this in terms of God's plan A, our plan B. In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 21, he says, For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, also in Christ all will be made alive. So he, he picks up this idea that we've been studying for three weeks so far, of that, okay, you have Adam who made one choice, and then we have the other side of that, which is Christ, who is sometimes called the second Adam. And this is actually the basis of our plan A versus God's plan A, because Adam brought death to us. Adam made bad choice, the choice to define good and evil for himself, good and bad for himself. So, so in Adam came death, and then by a second man, by Christ, came the fixing of that, the resurrection from the dead, coming back from the dead and, and being made alive. So then skip down to verses 42 through 49 as he continues to talk about the resurrection. And part of why we're not taking it all is because in Corinth, there was a group of people who were questioning whether there wasn't any such thing as resurrection from the dead. And so Paul is arguing and, and showing why there is and why that's important. That's not our, not our focus today, but we want to learn some of what he says about this coming back from the dead, this resurrection. So verses 42 through 49 so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. He's using a planting metaphor. You plant it in the ground, but something different comes up. You plant a seed, up comes a plant. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. As is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. And again, Paul's language, it's hard, it translates hard, so sometimes we're like, huh, what do you mean, Paul? And it's just because it's the, it's the translation of how Paul thought and how we think. But what he's basically, he's using a reality to also be a metaphor. It's two things going on here. He is talking about a, an objective reality of the fact that 
we have a body now and we're going to get a new body later. But he is also using it at the same time as a metaphor for the two different ways of life. The two different ways of life. And he's talking about the fact that Jesus had a Jesus was given an earthly body. He was born, and this is what we celebrate in, for Christmas. He was born in a human body. He had a mom, and he was had an earthly body, and he was a baby, and he pooped, and had messy diapers, and he got hungry, and he got tired, and he when he walked, he probably got blisters. He had a normal human body, and this human body is a lot of things. It's natural, just happens. Everybody gets one. It's natural, and it, then it says a lot of things. It's perishable, and as I come up on this big birthday, I am very aware of the perishable nature of, of this body. I've always had amazing eyesight. I've always had ama- my whole life, I've had amazing eyesight, and now I have good eyesight. Amazing is, has disappeared, and now I find myself sometimes doing things like going like this, and I go, wait, why am I doing that? Why, you know, and my kids will say, hey, look at this, Dad, and I'll go... Oh, there it is. And I'm like, wait, what, what's, I've never had to do that before. Ooh, oh. You know, or when I get, you know, I stand up. I've been standing up for 49 years. Now I stand up and I go, ooh. I'm like, what's that? Ooh. Why am I, why do I grunt? Ooh. Well, because apparently standing up is more work than, I don't know. It's weird. It's perishable. There are things that go wrong with it. It's weak. And he talks about all those different things here. All right? Dishonor, weakness, natural. These are the problems with this body. And it's the problems with this body all the way through. He says, but then there's this other body that's coming and it's different. And it's not natural primarily. It's spiritual. And it's not weak. It has power. And it's not perishable. It doesn't perish. And so I have this other body to look forward to. And how do I know what it will be like? Well, because Jesus has already gotten his. And that's why it says he's the first fruits. He's the first one. He got it first. I'll get mine later. So, and then again, he brings up this. You have Adam. And then you have Jesus. And they take two different tracks. They represent, Adam represents our plan A. Let me do it myself. Jesus represents God's plan A. Let me do it for you. So then the question we like to debate is, could Adam have been God's plan A? If Adam had behaved himself, could he have been plan A? And theologians, which don't focus on real life, but just focus on cool questions because they want to debate, have fun with this. But the answer is actually really straightforward and doesn't require argument, is no. No. Why couldn't Adam have been plan A? Because Jesus was always plan A. Jesus was always plan A. Adam was never going to be plan A. If Adam had obeyed, who would have been plan A? Still Jesus. Jesus was always plan A. Because the whole point of the whole exercise, people say, well, if God knew what Adam was going to do, then why did he allow Adam to fall? Because Jesus was always the plan. Jesus was always the plan And the reason that God, in his wisdom and perfect plan, allowed in his perfect plan for Adam to not be perfect was because the whole point of the exercise was for us to understand that we cannot do it on our own. And Adam, being perfect without a sin nature, still couldn't do it on his own. That's the point of the exercise. It's not that God sat there and went, oh man, that didn't work out. No, it worked out fine. Because the point of the exercise is, Adam, you can't do it on your own. Even in your perfection, you can't do it. You need me. I created you to be with me, not to be on your own. And so that's why God's plan didn't go wrong in the garden. Jesus isn't coming to fix God's plan. He's coming to fix ours. And that's why we call the series God's Plan A, Our Plan B. People say, you know, and it's funny, there's a lot of worship songs that sometimes talk about this, that, you know, well, when, when, when you hit bottom, when everything goes wrong, you should turn to Jesus. Well, that's true. But you should turn to him before everything goes wrong. He's always plan A, and we treat him as plan B. Well, I'll try it on my own first. 
because that's our human pride, because I'll decide for myself. I can do it myself. I'm, we're self-determination people. In verses 42 through 49, talk about the fact that our body, our human body, is adapted, is adapted to this earthly experience. And that's why he keeps talking about it's, it's earthy. It's earthy. How do we live here on earth? We live by what we feel, by what we want. Sometimes the Bible uses the word lusts. And it just means, lust just means your desires. And that's how we live. And our body is adapted to that. It became adapted that way at the fall. The fall is not simply where Adam and Eve made a bad choice. Adam and Eve, during the fall, and you see it, it changes who they are. That's what he meant by, if you, if you take that for yourself, if you take that fruit for yourself, you will die. It didn't mean they were going to fall over dead. It means that they are now incorporating death into their existence. And their life suddenly didn't become about God. It became about themselves and what they wanted. And it happened before they took a bite of the fruit because Eve, why did she take the fruit? Because she decided she wanted it. It looked good. The fall is already happening before she even takes the fruit. She's already fallen. It's not just that they ate the apple. The ap or it wasn't an apple, sorry. The fruit, we say apple all the time. It's because of why she took it. I'm taking this knowledge for myself. And as a result, we are now adapted to that. And that's why we're always fighting it. That's why we're always fighting it. Because our bodies are adapted to living here and living by what we want. That's how our bodies work. We don't have to try to do it. It comes naturally. And it says, and that's what it says, this body is now natural. It's now based on, give me what I want. Give me what I feel. And what we see going on in our culture now is a greater and greater celebration of a wider and wider array of desires. Where however you feel, whatever you feel is right for you, whatever you desire, no one should tell you that that's bad. No one should tell you, no. If I feel it, if that's how I understand my identity, then that's what I should do. I need to live my reality. Well, that's all of us. That's what we want. That's our plan A. What this is talking about is the day is going to come when we are going to be given a new body. And this new body is going to be adapted to God's plan where we will not be constantly at war with ourselves. Where we will have a body where those desires will not be constantly pulling at us. What's interesting is there's been, in the last few years, there's been a few Christians who have come out with an altern alternative sexuality. They've come out and said, oh, I'm this now. And one of the things that they say, and I, and I think it's very truthful, very, they're being very honest. They say, oh, I'm so tired of the struggle. And now, now that I've given up the struggle and I've, I've embraced this desire within me, oh, I feel such peace. I feel so, it feels right now. It feels good. And I, I don't know why I fought it for all those years. Of course. Of course you're going to feel peace. It's not because you're right with God. It's not because you're doing the right thing. But when you fight the body, it hurts. Saying no to the things I desire is uncomfortable. Sitting on the couch versus getting on the treadmill, one feels better than the other. Which is why last night, last night, come home, we had the meal here, but I didn't eat supper because I've been trying to eat less. I had a big lunch, so I didn't eat supper. When I got home and I was, what they say, peckish, I was hungry. I wasn't hungry for just anything. I wanted something salty. And I was wandering around the kitchen at war with myself, literally wandering around the kitchen at war with myself, because I'm really, I really want to lose weight. I really want to, I'm, I'm sick of 
being uncomfortable. And because I'm getting older, I know I, there's a lot at stake if I don't do good things here. But I really just want some chips. <laughs> and thinking about, you know, in another five or ten years, if you don't get your act together, you could have some real health issues, as opposed to in the next ten minutes, chips would be great. Well, what wins? Five to ten years from now or the next five minutes? Five minutes! And I, re and I remember I was looking at the top of the fridge, because that's where the chips are, and I'm like, why can't they just make, like, broccoli? And I, I like broccoli, preferably with cheese. I'm like, why can't they make things that are really good for you taste as good as chips? How come the good stuff isn't as good as the bad stuff? Well, it's because our whole world is adapted to the wrong thing. And my body is adapted to the wrong thing. But when I give in to it, it feels great. Why? Because this body is adapted to the wrong thing. And so when people come out, they say, you know what? Oh, I feel so much better. And we say, oh, well, they, they mu if the, the struggle must be bad, and when they come out, then they feel peace, that must be good. No, doing your own thing is always going to feel better. It doesn't make it the right thing. We are adapted to the wrong thing. And that's what's going on in our world today. And that's why the message of the gospel is so offensive. Because the whole message of the, the good news is you were not designed originally to do whatever you wanted. It's not good for you. That's the good news. But for now, our problem is right now, I still got this body and I'm at war with it. I'm at war with my natural body because my natural body is adapted to life here. So turn back a, cha a, pay a book sorry, to Romans. And Romans is going to talk about what we do with this. What is the practical application of the resurrection since you and I both still are in this body? We have not gotten our new body yet. We haven't been resurrected yet because this body is still alive. This body is still in its present form. And this is where we really need to understand why rules don't work. We saw last week, or two weeks ago, that it says the rules, following the rules, are totally ineffective in controlling those desires. The rules are ineffective in controlling those desires. Why? Because the rules come in to try to change you on the outside, and those desires come deep within. So it's not a fair fight. The rules may win for a while, but the desires will win out because they're so strong. Because they come from within you. And that's why if the change doesn't come with, with, from within, eventually you'll give in. And you'll go, oh, I feel such a sense of relief. I'm now being true to myself. You're right, you are. And that is not a good thing. But boy, it feels good. There's a way that seems right to a person, to a man, but it ends in death. Romans 6, 8 through 23. And let's just read what he says here. Now, if we have died with Christ. So he's talking metaphorically because we are not dead yet. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. This is, a, again, talking resurrection. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So he's talking about he, his body died, and physically and spiritually, metaphorically, he put away that earthly desire, that sin. And now his life is all about God. Verse 11, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. He says, so because that's already happened to Jesus, consider, think like that's already happened to you. Has it happened to you yet? No. And that's why he says, it's almost like pretend, but it's not pretend. You're not making something up. You're just anticipating it, or we also call it hope. So then he explains what that looks like, verse 12. Therefore since you're going to consider your body to have died. Therefore, do not let sin reign, rule, in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. 
And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments, tools of bad behavior, of unrighteousness. But present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness, of goodness, to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you're slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, that results in death, or of obedience, resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed, and, have, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms. Because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For you were, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of these things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification, and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now again, the writing is, it, there's a lot there, and, and as it translates into English, we can get lost in it. So let's just go through the rest of it. So first there in verse 12, he says, live like you already got resurrected. Live like you already have the new body. You don't. But consider like you do. Don't let your old body rule with its desires. Don't let that be what's in charge anymore. And then he says, don't even give the parts of your body to that. Oh, that's a mouthful right there. Because the parts of my body sometimes want to do what they want to do. He says, don't, don't give in to them. Don't put them in charge. Don't let them do whatever they want. Verse 14, he says, now you have a new master. You don't have to let that be what dictates your life anymore. But notice what this new master is, and this is so important. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And that's tricky, because when we say, okay, I'm not going to let sin rule over me, so what am I going to live by? The rules. Nope. How do I live by not letting me, not having myself do whatever I want? Not by following the law. He says, not by law. But by grace. By how much God loves me. That's the rule. Not the right thing to do. But the one who loves me. And that's what we oftentimes get wrong as a bunch of conservative Christians, right? Don't live that way. Follow the rules. He says, that is not what you're, that's, I mean, it's explicit. You are not under law. You are under grace. You're under the, un, what is grace? Undeserved favor. So don't follow what you want. Follow the one who loves you so much undeservedly. And that's a whole different motivation, isn't it? Then I got to be good now. I'll tell you, the biggest thing that is, that is working to constrain my behavior is not that I've decided that all these things are bad. It's that I am trying to embrace something better. I'm trying to embrace something better. Help. And I find that when I focus on trying to be healthy, that is far more motivating than trying to not just eat bad food. The goal is much more motivating. And here I have been loved. I have been accepted. That's what I live under. And that's why he says, so verse 15, he says, so now, no, this isn't about doing whatever you want. This is not about living under law. It's understanding how much God loves you. Verse 16, you will obey something. God has given you two options. Before, you only had one option. The world only knows one thing. I've got to be true to myself. What else is there? 103, there's, there's, all, there's tons of religions, everything else. Every single one of them says, here's, here's a bunch of rules. 
to help you be you, to be good. If God's giving you another option, don't make it about you with its desires and urges. Verse 17, it says you're going to be obedient from the heart. From the heart. Again, see, it's from the inward. It changes you from the inside out. And then verse 19, he says, the reason I'm even going over this is because the weakness of your flesh, because you're so weak, because it's so hard. He says, that's why we're talking about this, because you're flawed. The flesh is weak. And in there, you should hear an echo of Jesus as it comes time to give up that flesh. And he knows what it means to follow God. And he's going to die. He's going to be tortured in the next 24 hours. And he says to his disciples, will you stay up tonight and just be with me? Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus was sinless, but he still had an earthly body. And so he had the same problem we had. He had a body that was adapted to the wrong thing. And he stayed up all night fighting it. And if you watch through the life of Jesus, you see him constantly at war with a body that wants to please itself. That's why the first temptation, when Satan comes and tries to take Jesus out, his first temptation is, you haven't eaten in 40 days. Wouldn't you like a snack? Of course I want a snack. I'm starving. I haven't eaten in 40 days. Yes, I want a snack. It's a huge temptation. And that's why he gets mad at Peter when he says, I've got to go up and die. Peter says, no, we don't want you to die. He says, Peter, shut up. You are, you're, you're, you're a stumbling block to me. Why? Because I can't do what I want. And you're, you're urging me in the wrong direction. You're giving me good human advice, good earthly advice. But I'm living for God. So why? Why go through it? Why fight this miserable battle? Well, he explains it. Because in verse 19, he says, listen, I know your flesh is weak. And so then he, gives, he puts the argument in ways hopefully we can understand. He says, verse 20, for when you were giving in to sin, when you were serving sin, when you were doing whatever you wanted, you were free in regards to rightness. In other words, you didn't have to worry about trying to fight this. But then he asks a stark question in verse 21. Therefore, what benefit were you deriving from that? What good was that for you? For the outcome of those things is death. But you've been freed from that. And there you'll derive your benefit. You'll get a new benefit. Life. Life that lasts forever. For the wages of sin, the what the payout is death. But the gift that God wants to give you is life. So he's, he's not making a threat. He's showing you what's wise. He goes, why would you do that? You know it doesn't end well for you. And as I was wandering around the kitchen last night, I had to remember that what benefit will I have from doing what right now feels good. If I had an English muffin. Not help food, but it wasn't chips. I left the chips on top of the fridge. I'm not going to call that a win, but I didn't eat the chips. What benefit? I want to live. Do you know that the statistic is statistics, but they say around 80 to 90% of people who have had a heart issue and are told by their doctor, you need to change X, Y, and Z, or you will die sooner, that between 80 and 90% of people do not change X, Y, and Z. Their life is on the line, and they still don't change, whether it's the cigarettes or the food or whatever. Why? Because we, we don't like to say no to us. I want it. And so we don't do what's, we don't, we don't embrace life. We embrace death. Because it feels good right now. It's what satisfies me today. 
oh, I'm, I'm tired of the struggle, and now I feel at peace. Ah, all right. If it's not a long-term benefit, God wants to give us life. So the day is coming when we'll get a better body. The day will come where I will be given a body that I'm not at war with, that I'm not fighting. And I'll tell you, getting older and seeing my body begin to not be as nice to me is a reminder of its flaws. It's there to remind me that I cannot serve this body because it's going to, it's going to fail me. And that is a metaphor and a reality of this world. The passing pleasures of this body are very much passing. And if this is all I invest in, that is such a short-term investment. And so for now, I need to treat this body like it's already dead. I need to treat its desires as it cries out for its own life to say, no, I want more. You no longer get to choose for me. Oh, it's hard because it pushes back. It says, but I want, but I need. And I say, you're not in charge anymore. I have given us over to someone else. He has my best interests at heart. You don't. You don't know. You're not wise enough to make good long-term choices. All you know is you want chips now. So I have turned management of this over to someone who's got a better plan. You're dead to me. And when you cry out for the things you want and feel you need, I say no. And that's the battle. But dying that way brings me great life by God. And I have to start now. And later, we'll finish. Later, when I am raised with the new body that I'm not at war with, that's, the, that's when we're done. So, two last examples of this on the human level. So as we went into Berea again, back in Ju 1st of July, I knew... Because by the, end of, by the end of a Sunday, I'm in pain. Physically, I'm in pain. Usually by about 4 o'clock. If you come in for choir, a lot of times you'll find me laying down. It's because I'm in pain. It's not like sharp, searing pain. I'm just uncomfortable. Why? Because I'm overweight. And my body is tired of lugging it around all morning. And it begins to hurt. So I lay down. I didn't like that. And I didn't like that when I would try to do things, I would get winded. And I realized something's got to change because I'm pursuing immediacy far too often. So I started trying to do some stuff differently. So I was like, well, I'm going to start doing a push, do push-ups every night. And I couldn't do a push-up. <laughs> Not a one. <laughs> so somebody told me, well, you can start on your knees. All right. And I was like, you know what? I love Coke. Oh, I love Coke. I love a good Coke. <sighs> All right, I'll stop drinking Coke. That was the end of the summer. I made that decision. So now it's second week, end of the first week of December, and I've done push-ups every night since the first week of July. I'm doing two sets of 50 every night. Oh, it took six months, <laughs> and I'm not there yet, and I haven't had a Coke since August. Not a one. But the body I have today hurts less. I'm not there yet. I've got a long way to go, but I'm not there yet. But it hurts less. And I'm beginning to see the starts. But I'm still, the sand isn't flowing up the hourglass. This body is not, I, I'm never going to turn this body into the body I'm going to get. But already, it's easier. It's already easier. 
as I started to try to crucify this flesh in just a few small areas, it's easier. Because now I go out to eat, and I don't even, I, like I used to not order a Coke, now I don't order a Coke. Do you understand the difference? Like, I don't even think about it anymore. I just don't. And every night, I don't try to do push-ups. I just do. They're automatic now. I'm not fighting that anymore. My body has adapted a little bit. Because you can make the flesh your slave. It'll fight you. But I need to, the more I treat my body as dead, and that's what Paul said elsewhere. He said, I buffet my body. I beat my body up and I make it my slave rather than me being a slave to it. And that's all just while I'm waiting for the day that he will give me a body that I'm not at war with anymore. But for now, consider the members of your body dead to the desires and alive to God. Because he's got plan A, and it's a good plan. Let's pray. Father, Lord, this is hard stuff, and it's so real in our day-to-day -day lives because we are not good at saying no to ourselves. We have strong desires. We have strong urges. Our body wants things. It needs things. And when we don't get those things, our body screams at us. It feels like death because it is the form of death. Lord, you know this better than we do because you actually said no to your body in the most extreme way possible. You allowed yourself to be executed, to be tortured and beat up and killed. You allowed that. You chose to lay down your full and complete life, not even just parts of it. Lord, we have trouble saying no to second helpings. We have trouble saying no to habits that we know are killing us, but... We like them so much, they have become part of who we are. Lord, we look forward to the day that you are going to free us from this body of death. We look forward to the day you have shown us you can do it because Jesus already got his body, so we know that you can do this. We look forward to the day we get a body like that, a body that we don't have to be at war with. But Lord, we know the reason we're stuck in this one is because we chose it. That our father Adam brought this death to us as he chose follow his desires as Eve chose to follow hers. And Lord, that we relive that choice every day when we choose to follow our flesh. But Lord, thank you for freeing us from that, that we don't have to do that. We can choose not to by embracing the one who loves us. Not by trying harder, but by giving up. And focusing our eyes deeply on you and your love for us. By looking to you, not looking within, but looking to you and understanding the grace that you have poured out upon us. Lord, we thank you that you love us as we are in our broken and rebellious ways, and that we are fully accepted by you. May we accept that and then, and then live it up by focusing on you each day by living in you each day. Because that will give us the strength to say no to our bodies. And Lord, to live for you. Thank you, Father, for your great love for us. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue this thought next week, so if you'll come back, we're going to keep working on this. Let's stand and sing.